Hey guys, Tisha here, and we are back for another Love Times 3 reading. This is chapter four and one makes three. This is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. John 15, 12 through 13. In our family, adding another wife is nothing like what you've seen on Big Love or heard about in some polygamous sex. Not that he would ever consider it, but Joe would be out in his rear if he pursued an underage girl or did any courting without our knowledge and consent. That is not something that the Browns did because it's evident that Cody did some courting without his wife's knowledge. He may have later gotten their consent, but he, he started the process a little bit without them. Joe was, in fact, initially hesitant about courting Val. There was a lot to consider for us and for Val. That's why none of us expected their courtship to unfold the way it did. Valerie, I knew in my heart that God had released me from my covenant with Donald, but I wanted the AUB to give me an official release. That's the word fundamentalist Mormons use to describe a divorce in a religious, non-legal marriage. I wonder if this is kind of what Cody them were talking about that they never went and, and sought out. But I, I, I think it's called something different for them. But here you have a woman who knew that this is what she wanted. So she sought out the, the proper channels to try to figure out if it would be okay, which is why I feel like the divorce is not something that Janelle wants because she has yet to seek out the, the proper channels. She's holding out for some reason. Anyways, let's get back to this book. So for months after I moved to Montana, I returned to Utah to attend a church disciplinary council where my request would be heard. Two of my former sister wives who still lived in Pleasant Valley also planned to ask the council to end their marriages to Donald. And I wanted to be there for them. I wasn't sure what our church leaders would do, given their disapproval of divorce, except in the most extreme circumstances. Like the other women, I brought my supporters, my sister Bonnie and another woman who was highly respected in the AUB. But I was still really nervous as I walked into the hearing where a handful of men were already seated at a conference table. Interesting that she doesn't say a handful of people. She says a handful of men, which makes me wonder if all of their leaders, if everyone on the council has to be male. Donald wasn't there yet, and we had to wait for him to arrive, accompanied by his one remaining wife. So he went from having six wives to now only having one wife that was remaining with him. That, that speaks volumes in itself. The meeting proved more difficult than I expected. Donald grew increasingly defensive as the other wives and I shared our stories, refusing to acknowledge the grievances we had or take any responsibility for the collapses of our marriages. I left the meeting with hope, but also a heavy heart. Everyone in the room now had heard my full story and finally knew the truth, which lightened my load, but it had not been easy to share so many deeply personal things. I don't like this. Because I feel like you're not God. And, and for those of you who aren't religious, just excuse me for a second. But let me say this. In my opinion, if there is something wrong with a woman and a, and a man, man and a man, woman and a woman, whatever your, your situation is, if there's something wrong with yourself and your partner and you want to get some advice, go ahead and get some therapy or whatever, whatever. But if I have grievances and if I've tried to work with this person and nothing has been done on that other person's side to make the marriage work, I don't need to come to you to ask you if I can get divorced. I'm getting a divorce. But their beliefs are different, so this is what they do. I went to my sister Vicky's house where my children and I had planned to spend the night before returning to Montana. Since leaving Donald, I had spoken to Vicky on the telephone often and had shared some of what had happened to it by Barrett. Excuse me. She was, to my surprise, understanding and supportive. I knew that Vicky, Joe, and Alina strongly opposed divorce. I was afraid they would see me as spiritually weak and criticize my decision to leave, especially since I had always emphasized Donald's good qualities to others, glossing over our troubles. 
Vicky, Alina, and I were in the playroom with the children when jo Joe came home from work that night. Joe said hello to the others and then our eyes locked across the room. In that moment, I felt an energy bounce between us. Them and this energy. The exchange lasted only seconds, but it was real and it was profound. What was that? I asked myself, I hadn't had any feelings whatsoever for Joe since marrying Donald, so I was taken by surprise. This wasn't a jolt of mere physical attraction either. It was something else, but I didn't know what to make of it. So does that mean she never felt that feeling with her first husband? Just wondering. After the children were in bed, Joe, Alina, Vicky, and I talked late into the night. Finally feeling safe and secure enough to speak openly, I began to reveal the heartache, deprivation, and manipulation I experienced in my marriage. We laughed at some of the stories and cried together at others. As a general rule, my mother and sisters and I never spoke openly about sex, so I cringed with embarrassment as I disclosed our most private problems. But talking was cathartic, and I realized how much support I could have received from them over the years if I had not been so reluctant to open up. That's understandable that she was a little hesitant. And I feel like a lot of us keep certain things um, private. I know that there's a lot of things that I went through in a past relationship that I would never, ever dare tell uh, my father, especially. So I can understand why she may, you know, have been reluctant to share certain things. As the hours passed, both Vicky and Alina fell asleep on the couch, but Joe and I continued talking. I told him of my worry that as a divorced woman, I would carry a stigma that would keep any good man from considering me as a wife. Joe said that a divorce alone would not stop him from marrying a woman if he felt spiritually connected to her. As I... Let me make sure I didn't skip a page. Okay, I didn't. As I drove back to Montana the next day, I was relieved and revived. The hearing was over. I later received a release. And if the divorce wasn't an obstacle to Joe, perhaps there were other good men who felt the same way. I was far from being ready to seriously consider another relationship, but the thought that I might eventually fit into another family was reassuring. After months of emotional upheaval, I was finally beginning to resolve doubts and questions about my life, my faith, and my future. Had my marriage been all bad? No. Was I a bitter, was I a better, stronger, and more aware woman than I would have been without the experience with Donald? Yes. People, not religion, were to blame when a marriage failed. I realized there were examples of good plural marriages all around me. Seeing men who were living the principle the proper way confirmed my belief that the plural marriage often brought a greater spiritual awareness. Now, here's the thing. She can say that there were better marriages all around her, but at one point she did say that she thought that Donald and his other wives had ideal marriages. So does she really know if there are better marriages around her? No. But there were still fractures in my faith, and I was not sure I would ever find a man I could trust again. Going forward, I wanted to leave myself open to God's direction, and I prayed that he guide me to a better life. I also wrote a letter in my journal to the, to the faceless, nameless partner I hope to find someday. It was both a prayer and an expression of faith in what God had in mind for me. To my future companion. Thank you for loving me, for loving my children. Thank you for being genuine and sincere. Thank you for being patient. Thank you for being willing, being willing to take on the responsibility of me and my five children, for being generous enough to raise someone else's children. Thank you for being so kind that my children love you as much as their own father. Thank you for waiting for me and providing for me. Thank you for loving the Lord. Thank you for protecting me and believing in me for caring. Thank you for providing me with a home. Thank you for trusting in God. Thank you for being such a cool person, for letting me be a part of your life. Thank you for treating me like an equal. Thank you for making my opinion count. Thank you for respecting me and considering me. Thank you for helping me. Thank you for taking as long as it takes. Thank you for being a good, honorable man. Thank you for being you, whoever you are. Interesting that she did that. I do believe that there is power in the tongue. So maybe her writing that down uh, was her manifesting some things for herself. So I can respect that. Over the next several months, Vicky and Alina called often to chat. 
I also received a letter from Joe who offered encouragement and even sent a little money to help me make ends meet. I wrote back and soon we struck up a correspondence. My children were struggling with the upheaval in their lives and Joe gave me advice about how to help them process their hurt and anger. After exchanging several letters, Joe called me late one night and for the first time told me about a strong feeling he had months earlier when our eyes met across the room at their home. Did you feel something in that moment, he asked. I did, and it's not something I can't just ignore. I didn't answer him immediately. Gratefully, that the house was dark and quiet around me. It had been easy to put aside what I experienced that evening because it had happened so fast and I wasn't sure what it was or whether Joe had felt it too. Now, my thoughts raced. What should I say? If I tell the truth, I'll be opening a door that I'm not sure I'm ready to walk through. I chose my words carefully. Yes, I felt something, an energy. I conceded, but I don't know what it means and my impressions may not have been the same as yours. I appreciated Joe's courage in speaking up and raising the possibility of a relationship, something I knew he wouldn't have done without the support of Vicky and Alina. I found it amazingly easy to talk with Joe about my life and my children, but my guard was still up, and I'm sure he heard the hesitation in my voice as I agreed to consider whether there might be something between us. If I could be a fly on the wall to hear the conversation that he had with his wife, who is also the twin of his his soon-to-be wife, that's weird. That that's that I still feel like it's a little odd, y'all. I can't get past that. The idea of getting into another relationship frightened me. I knew I needed more time to figure out who I was, what I needed, and what I wanted in my life. Hours later, as I tried to fall asleep, the conversation played over and over in my mind. What is Joe thinking? What am I feeling? I'm not ready. Not ready, not ready. At the end of May, Joe, Alina, Vicky, and their children came to Montana for a visit over a long weekend. I was still living in the basement of my sister's home and had a part-time housekeeping job at the Stock Farm, a local resort. Any free time I had was focused on my children, who were having difficulty adjusting to the many changes in their lives. That's understandable. On the last day of their visit, Joe happened to come by as my oldest son stormed through the house after a telephone conversation with his father. Of all my children, he was the one who found my div my divorce most difficult, of course, because he truly understood kind of that he was being separated from his siblings. He probably was the one who was most around his father and he missed them. That's my assumption. And I was powerless to buffer him from the pain and the anger he was experiencing. I stood there staring after my son, helpless. Joe, seeing the look on my face, walked over and gave me a huge hug. With that true, selfless, caring embrace, I felt as though someone had thrown me a lifeline. In 12 years of marriage, I had never been hugged like that. What? What? In 12 years of marriage, you never received a hug where you felt relief from the person that you married? I'm not even, I'm not even an overly affectionate person, right? Like it, it takes me a little bit longer, group a little bit differently. I wasn't told I love you a whole bunch and things of that nature. I knew that my parents loved me, but they weren't raised like that. And it kind of trickled down, right? So honestly, my son is who softened me up. My son caused me to to drop some walls and, and, and really embrace the love that he had for me because my son is a very loving person. With that being said, when it comes to those that I care about, example, my son, like I said, and my man, I do show affection. So to think that you were married for 12 years and you didn't receive that embrace from the person that you love and that you, you had these five children with. Wow. That's, ooh. That Joe and I, that afternoon, <laughs> I just want to skip to Joe. <laughs> That afternoon, Joe and I went for a long drive together. We talked a lot about my children. I had shielded them from my marriage problems to such an extent that I didn't know how to help them understand what had happened or why. Joe gave me a lot of good advice, even encouraging me to avoid destroying their dad in their eyes. 
Just as we got back to my sister's house, it started to rain and I headed straight for the trampoline. Jumping in the rain is one of my favorite things to do. And by the time I stopped, I was soaking wet. I went inside to change and Vicky followed me into my bedroom. We had been in there a while talking when Alina and Joe asked if they could join us. Joe began telling me they'd had a great visit. I started to reply, but he interrupted me. Wait, he said, we don't want to leave without talking about the possibility of you coming into our family. We've talked about it and prayed about it as a family and we'd like you to consider it. It was the first time we talked openly and my heart was beating so hard I thought I might faint. Joe asked me if I was okay. Yeah, just overwhelmed, I said, attempting to smile. Joe reminded me of the worry I had expressed months earlier that no man or family would be interested in me. We are, he said. We want what's best for you, Vicky added. We know you've been through a lot, but I want you to know how much we care for you. We parted that evening with a commitment to continue praying about whether this was the right step for all of us. They're already handling this situation a lot differently than what we've seen with the Browns. Here you have this family that's act actively discussed this before Joe even really approached her about courting her. He seems to have spoken to his wives first. He gains points with me for that. Um, I had a lot to think about. I didn't feel ready to begin a relationship with anyone, but at the same time, I couldn't dismiss either the growing interest I had in Joe or their feelings for me. I wanted to keep an open mind and heart despite my tentativeness. And I was humbled that Vicky and Alina would want me in their family. They were such good women, so dedicated to their children and devoted to living up to the ideals of the fundamentalist Mormon faith. I knew they would not have approached Joe or me about their feelings unless they were truly open to having another sister wife in their lives. The fact that Joe was married to Vicky, my twin, didn't bother me at all. That's weird. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's so weird. How did that not bother you? I took it as a sign that he would be as good of a husband for me as he was for her. It seemed natural to me. What? As teenagers, Vicky and I had at times liked some of the same guys. Joe among them. When I first began contemplating marriage, I thought it might even be good if we married the same man. Like many twins, Vicky and I had always had a special bond and I was really touched that she was willing to share her husband and her life with me. I couldn't have asked for a better references on Joe than the love, trust, and respect he, Vicky, he and Vicky showed each other. Joe fit all the characteristics I had listed months earlier in the thank you note I had written to my future husband. I admired the way he was able to talk about the hard things with tenderness and concern. I also liked the way he valued his wife's opinions and encouraged their interests. But frankly, I was less concerned with figuring out who Joe was or how he might live up to my hopes and expectations. The thing that mattered to me most was to know what direction God wanted me to take. Several weeks later, I went to Utah to visit family and continue investigating my feelings for Joe. He had agreed to help me look for a car and we spent half a day scouting the options at the dealerships around Salt Lake Valley. Afterward, we went to park and talk. Joe opened his heart telling me stories about his life, his faith, and what he saw in his future. He also asked me a lot of probing questions, questions that forced me to process my buried feelings. At one point in the conversation, all the emotions I had kept bottled up over the past few months bubbled over and I started to weep. I don't know why I'm crying, I told Joe. I thought I was past all that. It's because your heart was broken and now, and now it's healing, he said. Oh, Joe is slick. He's a smooth talker. In that moment, my feelings and thoughts crystallized, and I was keenly aware of God's hand in bringing us together. I suddenly knew I would marry Joe. When we finally left the park, we drove to a nearby Jamba Juice store. We got out of the car, and as we stood in front of the building, 
Joe pulled me close, told me he loved me, and gave me a tender kiss. Whoa, 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 whoa. We're skipping a lot of steps here. These people move fast. She's only been divorced for a few months at this point. Here she is. She's had a little bit of exchanges, some correspondence here and there with Joe. Joe's talked to his wives about how he feels like she should be a part of the family. He felt some type of pull to her. He mentions it to her. They continue to speak. They tell her they want her to be a part of the family. Now, all of a sudden, he's pulling her in, telling her he loves her in a matter of months. They move quickly. That kiss was the question. Will you marry me? And answer all at once. Oh, that kiss was the question. Will you marry me? And my answer all at once. So everything happened at once. The kiss and the yes, apparently. In a way, I couldn't believe what was happening. I had left my husband just eight months earlier. But there was no escaping the feeling that I belong with Joe. He suggested that we go to the mall and get our picture taken, knowing we just made a life-changing decision. The photographer asked, what's the occasion? Joe said, we're engaged. Congratulations, the photographer said. How long have you been dating? I looked at Joe and I answered, a thousand years. From there, we went back to Joe's house to tell Vicky and Alina the news. I was nervous. Would they understand how quickly Joe and I had reached this decision? I smiled awkwardly while Joe described what happened, but Vicky and Alina eased my discomfort. They actually seemed to be expecting the news. Within a month, I moved to Montana, from Montana to Utah, settling with my children into a trailer behind the main family house. I told my children I planned to marry Joe, but I don't think it really sank in at first. With my decision to marry now made, I was eager to move forward, but our children, not just mine, but all of them needed time to adjust to the idea of becoming one family. We set a date in October and over the next three months began to blend our lives together. Two days before our marriage ceremony, Alina gave birth to the, her fifth child, Kyra. During our courtship, Alina had never made me feel I was taking Joe or anything else away from her. And she even invited me to attend the birth. I was thrilled to be able to share in this beautiful moment. I felt so connected to this little baby. We were both bring, beginning a new life, entering this family together. Interesting that uh, that baby arrived slightly before she got married. And Christine's baby arrived truly slightly before Robin got married. These people don't care what else they have going on. If they want to get married, they're going to get married. The wedding was a joyful celebration of commitment, love, and faith as we united as one family. Alina and Vicky stood beside me as I became Joe's wife. I was grateful for the sacrifice they were making to shake up their comfortable lives and accept me with five children in tow into their family. I felt completely surrounded by love. Joe and I spent our first night together as a married couple in the trailer, but not alone. All the little children wanted to spend the night there with us. And in the morning, Vicky's youngest daughter climbed into bed and snuggled with her dad. Not your typical wedding night, but I took it all in stride. Several weeks later, Joe and I went on a honeymoon. I had never been on a romantic vacation and to feel so loved and special was an amazing experience. Because remember, she just went to a motel with her other husband and that was that. Um, I appreciated that Joe was willing to take time for the two of us so that we could build a good foundation for our new life together. Our closeness would have come without the honeymoon, I'm sure, but far more slowly since in the normal course of life, I'd be alone with Joe only every third night. I had been naive when I first entered a plural marriage. This time I knew the range of challenges I would encounter and trusted my ability to conquer them. I was a stronger person and more attuned to my faith. I also had sister wives and a husband who were united in their views and who were dedicated to putting the family first. I felt valued and empowered. And I sensed that I had finally found a perfect place for me. Joe. When Donald and Val first married, the family lived in a large, well-kept house in Mapleton, and Donald, as far as I knew, was quite successful. I had no clue how greatly Val's situation had changed with their move. In fact, I was shocked the first time I visited Val in Pleasant Valley and saw the poverty she was living in. 
It was like taking a trip to a remote, isolated third world country. Wow. Their family had joined with several others in trying to start a fundamentalist Mormon, uh, I always say this word wrong, corporative, but it did not appear to be doing well. Such corporatives, or is it corporatives? Y'all, correct me in the comments, <laughs> are known as uh, United Order efforts and are based on revelation Joseph Smith received in 1831 about the law of consecration. The law calls for group members to pool their assets and labor to achieve self-sufficiency and income equality to eliminate poverty. So the whole goal of this was for them to eliminate poverty, but yet them doing this caused poverty. So they didn't succeed in their efforts. Val had a deep sense of responsibility for her choices, so deep that on a few occasions when Alina, Vicky, and I saw her at family gatherings over the years, she never said a word about the hardships she had to endure after moving to the enclave. Val was barely hanging on financially, which made us feel guilty, and she obviously missed Vicky tremendously. I encouraged Vicky to keep close contact with her sister. I also offered Donna rent -free, Donald rent-free use of our trailer home during his trips to Salt Lake City, which meant we'd see Val a little more frequently. In return, I asked that he keep the trailer and its yard in good condition and pay the utilities. He took me up on it, but within two months, he let down his end of the bargain. And when I approached him about our deal, I learned firsthand that he didn't have much integrity when it came to his commitments. He responded by moving out. And once Val seemed to vanish, and once again, Val seemed to vanish. Oh, so, he, wow. So he tried to help him out by giving him this whole trailer thing. All he had to do was keep the lawn up and pay utilities, and he didn't pay the utilities. And when questioned about it, he left. We had only intermittent contact for several years. And then we heard surprising news. Val had decided to leave Donald and move in with her sister in Montana. We knew so little about Val's marriage that my first concern was whether she was making the right choice. In my view, except in the most awful circumstances, the breakup of a family is tragedy for everyone involved. I had no sense of the depth and of abuse Val had experienced because she had never talked about it. Several months after moving to Montana, Val came back to Utah to ask her church priesthood council to officially free her from marriage. Up to that point, I had advised Vicky to be cautious in her conversations with Val because I did not want my family to be involved in the encouraging her to break a sacred commitment without a good cause. After her meeting, Val planned to spend the night at our house before traveling back to Montana. So he was really looking out for Val while all this was going on, talking to his wife and encouraging her to be careful with what she discussed with her because he basically didn't want to get pulled in the mess. After her meeting, she, she spent the night. I got home that night just as everyone gathered for evening prayer in the playroom. I put down my work and walked into the room where I saw Val kneeling with the rest of my family. As I looked at her, I heard her voice from deep within me say, she is to be your wife. Simultaneously, I felt as if I received an electric shock. I turned away quickly so no one would see the stunned look on my face and ask what was wrong with me. My religion teaches us to listen to the still small voice of the Holy Ghost. I believe inspiration comes in the space between our thoughts and I have found direction in my life by listening in that space where there is a deep and abiding peace. But this was an uncomfortable thought for numerous reasons. And at that moment, I did my best to ignore it. The last thing on my mind was taking on another wife. At age 30, I was just leaving a management position in an established company to start my own business, providing cafeteria services for large corporations. And after 10 years of marriage, I still had a lot of work to do to be a better husband. My marriage to Vicky had a bit of a rough patch a year or so earlier, and we were still working through it. Vicky, who is an amazingly detail-oriented analytical person, had taken a job as an accountant at our family-owned catering business. 
As she asserted more independence, I felt pushed away and we lost a lot of closeness. Why do these men struggle with women of power? Why does it mean because she asserted herself more that y'all lost your closeness? Why couldn't you all still remain close despite her assertiveness? I don't understand that part because it seems that that said a lot. Overall, our commitment to each other was unbreakable, but we had to work through some hurtful experiences. That night after the children were in bed, Alina, Vicky, Val, and I sat down together in the family room. Val was comfortable enough to reveal what she had gone through with Donald, the sexual manipulation, the emotional disconnect, the gambling, and the financial problems. As Val shared her story, I couldn't help but think about the message I'd heard when I first saw her earlier that evening and wondered if God would require me to take on more responsibility, but how could I do more? In addition to the career shift and my changing relationship with Vicky, I had just learned that Alina was expecting and I was feeling financially strained because I was supporting some members of my father's family. It also was hard to imagine Val considering a plural marriage again anytime soon, given her experience. She seemed embittered about men, marriage, and even about religion. I have been interested in Val way back in high school, but her life had gone in a different direction from mine. Until that night, I had never had the slightest feeling that Val was meant to marry me. I also never had any indication that Val was interested in our family. I kept my thoughts to myself. However, choosing to leave the spiritual prompting, I received about Val in God's hands. If it was meant to be, he would make it so. Val returned to Montana and I focused on my family and my new business, putting Val out of my mind. But weeks later, to my surprise, Alina and Vicky each approached me separately about her. Interesting. Alina came to me first. She told me she had felt strongly for some time that we should consider Val for our family. My reaction? Don't bring it up. I have enough to deal with, I said, closing off the discussion. Then a few days later, Vicky came to me and made an impassioned plea, listing all the reasons she thought Val belonged in our family. I was caught off guard because of what Vicky and I had recently gone through. I wouldn't have imagined her wanting any more stress in our relationship. But Vicky looked into my eyes and said, I really feel that Val should be in our family. I want her to feel the same love I do and be blessed with what I've had. I was deeply moved by Vicky's conviction about Val. Despite our recent difficulties, she considered our marriage a blessing that she wanted a sister to share. It took unselfishness and charity for Vicky to love her sister that much, knowing the sacrifice it would take. To me, she was living up to the Savior's teachings that laying down one's life for another is the greatest act of love. There have been times during our marriage when Alina, Vicky, and I had discussed women who seemed to show an interest in our family. Nothing had come of those overtures, however. Now they both had a strong feeling about Val, and given my own spiritual prompting, I had to consider it. I shared with Alina and Vicky the experience I had concerning Val when she came to town for her release hearing. We began praying about the matter together, which brought the three of us closer than ever. And once we were united in our feelings, we decided to move ahead, guided by our faith. Over the next few months, Alina and Vicky visited Val in Montana several times. I mostly stayed out of the picture to avoid putting any pressure on Val and to let my wives forge a bond with her first. He was, see, they're handling it different. This family is more concerned about the sister wives connection first and then the connection with the husband. We don't see that with the Browns, which may be why they had so many issues. Not to say you're not gonna have issues, but just something I'm noticing. We've been, we've been, did I read that? Oh yes, I did. I mostly stayed out of the picture to avoid putting any pressure on Val to let my wives forge a bond with her first. Socially, it was awkward since people in Val's Montana community speculated that a courtship was in the works every time they saw her speaking to a married man or his wife. Although I was drawn to Val and wanted to get to know her, dating a single woman with five children was new and unfamiliar territory for me. I kept in touch with Val through letters and phone calls. However, as I got to know her better, I was impressed. She had a sweet nature and inherent goodness and a real desire to do right. 
After a while, I decided it was time to be more open with my feelings. Excuse me. I called Val one night and told her about the strong prompting I had months earlier. I didn't go into too many of the specifics. That seemed like something I needed to share with her in person. But I said enough to let her know it had been a powerful moment for all of us and had led us to pray about whether she belonged in our family. It wasn't just nothing. Val, it was something I said. We all felt it. And when an experience like this happens, I have to look at it and investigate it. Val admitted she felt something too, though her impression was much less clear than mine. Understandably, Val still had her guard up, but she agreed to think about joining our family and to pray with us for more guidance. The next time I saw Val was when I took the whole family to Montana for the Memorial Day weekend. We had a great time, despite my uncertainty about how to approach Val and express my interest in her. Our conversations didn't stray far from safe general topics, religion, family problems, and financial concerns. She was struggling as a single mom to govern and provide for her five children. On the last day of the four of us, finally talked openly about our feelings, and we agreed again to keep praying and searching for an answer. We also told Val that if she decided to move back to Utah, which she was already considering, we'd help her with a job and a place to live. Our trailer was empty and there was plenty of work at the family business. We'd be able to help with the, her children. Furthermore, it would give us a chance to continue exploring the possibility of her joining our family. Val was non-committal and still guarded, but agreed to think about it. Several weeks later, Val came to Salt Lake City to visit the family and shop for a new car. I offered to help her and she readily accepted which I took as a sign she'd not been put off by our conversation. I thought it would take some time for Val to feel ready for marriage again, but I was encouraged. I had no idea that day would end as it did. Val and I visited several dealerships before finding a suitable car, a silver Chevy Astro van. Val hated it at first. It was the color her ex-husband had preferred, but the van was the right price and the right size. We made the deal. We then went to a park and over several hours talked about her marriage, her current views on religion and plural marriage, and what she was looking for in a husband and father for her children. I expected Val to be reserved, but instead it was as though there had been no 15-year gap between our first date and that afternoon. Our conversation flowed easily and openly. As we talked, I could feel the barriers coming down and sensed that Val was ready to move forward with her life. Val was so warm and accepting that I could tell her anything and everything, all of my deepest thoughts. In some moments, as I listened to Val, my heart ached for what she'd been through, and I wanted to give her all the love and protection she never had. We kept moving around the park, sitting in one spot for a while, then walking a bit and finding a new place to sit. Each time we sat closer to one another, and at one point in our conversation, I wrapped my arms around Val as she let go and cried. We finally left the park and drove to a juice store to get drinks. We got out the car. I took Val into my arms for the first time, told her the full story of the month, moments months earlier when our eyes had locked and I received a spiritual prompting that she was to be my wife. It seemed to me, I explained, that when I put our situation in God's hands, he opened the way for us. I didn't expect to reach this moment so soon, I said, but I know you belong in my family. I bent towards Val and she leaned in to meet me and without another word, we kissed. We walked to a nearby mall in days. Val was glued to me, not wanting to release my hand for a second. When we returned to the car, I called home to tell Vicky and Alina, we were on our way and to meet us in the living room because we had exciting news. I practically bounced into the house and didn't even bother to sit down before I started talking. I launched into an explanation of the day's events before breaking off to get to the point. Val's accepted us. We're going to get married, I announced. Now we just need to figure out how to make this happen in the best way possible for the children. Since we had assumed that it would take much longer for Val to realize she belonged to, in our family, the sudden announcement caught Alina and Vicky by surprise. It was clear, however, that they were thrilled. They felt the same way as I did about Val. Next, we visited Val's parents. We didn't need their permission at this point in our lives, but out of respect, I wanted them to know my intention. Val's father spoke without hesitation. Good on you, he said, smiling. I can't think of a better man for her. I guess because the father had seen how Joe loved his daughter and, and grandkids, he determined that this was okay. I still think it's a little weird, but 
they received the, whatever revelation they received. Many people advised me to wait a while before marrying Val. Even close friends and family did not understand how we could have made this decision so quickly. Some thought it was a mistake for me to take another wife when we already had such a great family. But Alina, Vicky, and Val and I knew it was right, and we were ready. A long courtship, in my view, is inappropriate when a man is married, particularly once the woman has agreed to join the family. The dating stage of my relationship with Val was hard for Vicky and Alina. They were giving up time with me, trusting it would work out with Val. And since Val was not yet a part of the family, she couldn't be included fully in the family routine. It was awkward to go on a nice date with Val and then return home to whichever wife I was supposed to be with that night. There was an important reason, however, for us to wait. We wanted to give the children in both families time to adjust to each other. Val's children, who had always known me as Uncle Joe, also needed to get used to the idea of me as their father. When Val and her children moved into the trailer behind our house, we continued courting, both as a couple and as a family. There were still moments when I questioned my ability to take on this new responsibility. I literally broke down and cried at one point. I love his honesty here. I love that he's admitting it because that's a big task. Not only are you adding another wife when you said that you were concerned about finances at one point, but you just had another baby, I'm assuming, soon because we heard that uh, during that his wife had a baby and you're adding an additional five mouths to that. I just spent a few hours visiting with Val. I came into our house and collapsed in a living room couch in a daze, barely able to breathe. When Vicky and Alina asked if I was K, okay, I lost it. I don't know if I could do this, I said. I don't know if I have it in me to do what I know marrying another wife is going to take. How am I going to support everyone financially? How am I going to provide all the emotional support everyone will need? How am I going to be a father to Val's kids? At times like that, I really needed the support of my wives and the comfort of my prayers we set a wedding date for september three months out but couldn't make it work between alina's due date and my company's opening a new cafeteria at intel's corporate office in utah we had too much going on so we moved the wedding date to mid-october i opened the new cafeteria on october 6. alina went past her due date but finally delivered our baby girl kyra at home with the help of a midwife on October 12th, two days later, Val and I were married at a ceremony that took place in our living room with Alina and Vicky standing beside us as we exchanged sacred vows before close family members. The four of us celebrated at the restaurant that night and that weekend we rented a hall and threw a party for more than 100 people in our extended families. We were honoring a marriage, but we also knew uh, also a new stage in the growth of our family. Several weeks later, Val and I went on a 10-day honeymoon to the Napa Valley in Hawaii. Oh, so Robin and Cody weren't the only ones who went on long honeymoons because they went on a 10-day one. It was hard to leave the rest of the family behind. <laughs> I'm just saying, we saw what problems that caused in that one. I wonder if it caused any problems in this one. It was hard to leave the rest of the family behind, but I knew, as did Alina, Val, and Vicky, that Val and I needed this sweet romantic time together. Val had never had a full, deep relationship built on trust, respect, and caring, so our love was a new experience for her. It was an exciting time for me, too, though it seemed strange after years of marriage to be experiencing the short-lived, all-consuming passion that comes in the initial stage of an intimate relationship. I felt out of balance. It would take time. I knew for my relationship with Val to match the depth and the substance of my relationship with Alina and Vicky. And it wasn't as though I could forget I was in love with them or not wonder about the children waiting for me at home. As it turned out, we ended the honeymoon a day earlier because we both missed the family so much. Okay, so they didn't stay the whole time, but they were gone for a long time. And that is the end of that chapter. Interesting how that came to be. In eight months time, she went from not knowing what she was going to do because she was a divorcee to uh, being engaged to her now husband, Joe. Guys, let me know your thoughts and opinions down below. Please comment, like the video, and subscribe if you have not done so already. I am on the road to a thousand 
And once I get there, we're only going up from there. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I'm enjoying this book. I hope you guys are too. Until next time.